Uh, Stan Kroenke has won the NFL, is about to win the H- NHL, and had Jamal Murray stayed healthy at the end of the season, could have contended for the NBA title. Where would you rank him in the owner's power rankings? That's hard to do without doing the full rankings from top to bottom. And also, it depends on who you ask. If you ask people in St. Louis, I know where he'd be ranked. If you ask people in L.A., he'd be ranked slightly higher. So I don't, I don't want to just throw a dart and pick a number because it's all – something that needs to be done in relation to all NFL owners. And I've thought about maybe like ranking the top 10, but you know what? I, I just don't want the extra headache because what will happen is if I say I'm going to do it, I will undoubtedly be lobbied by PR people to include certain owners because they are as petty as the rest of us, which is kind of refreshing. Even when you have billions, you still become very petty about what people say about you and where they rank you on these lists and, you know, Google in your own name and all that crap. Uh, and also I'll get complaints after the fact from people who are upset that they weren't, weren't ranked higher than they should have been or weren't on the list at all. So I'm probably not going to do that. And I, I'm just not going to throw a dart on Stan Kroenke. But again, ask the people in St. Louis what they think about Stan Kroenke. Another one from Neil Watch's PFT. If Deshaun Watson wanted to get back a version of his life closer to his life prior to these allegations, what would he need to do to regain a good public image? I don't know that he can ever get back to where he was. It's about what he could have done from the get-go, and we've talked about that. Settle the case, first case, before it was ever filed. Settle any other cases before they're ever filed, if there are other cases. There may have never been other cases if they hadn't pissed off Tony Busby by refusing to make an offer when he requested $100,000 to settle the Ashley Solis claim before the first lawsuit was filed. I don't know what he can do at this point, other than, end this now, serve your suspension, come back and play, and play well. And then the passage of time and the reality that there will be other controversies, other events, other things that we talk about and think about and write about, we will eventually forget about Deshaun Watson. There will be something else that is our focal point of the day. It happened with Ben Roethlisberger. It happened with Mike Vick. Things get either forgotten or not as vividly remembered. And I remember when Ben Roethlisberger with two allegations was the biggest story in the NFL. And he never had protracted litigation that commanded a ton of attention with 20 plus accusers. He only had two. He got suspended. He served his time. He came back. They went to the Super Bowl. Within a year or two, It was completely forgotten. And by the time he retired, if he even mentioned it, you were kind of regarded as a jerk. Don't mention that. That was a long time ago. Well, it's still part of his story. We're trying to reflect on the career of Ben Roethlisberger. And I think it's amazing the redemption he achieved in Pittsburgh, because back in 2010, when all of this was coming to a head, I remember listening via uh, online to Pittsburgh sports radio. It was just one person after another calling in with some random complaint about Ben Roethlisberger, how he was rude to the person here, cut in line at the subway uh, restaurant, whatever it was. It was just like all these ridiculously trivial complaints, but they, they, they were thinking about trading him. They almost traded him. Uh, it, it, was, it was a huge mess, and he turned it around by winning, by winning and by staying out of trouble. So that's how Deshaun Watson maybe won't erase these issues, but how he at least can get past it. Resolve the cases, serve the suspension, play good football, win games, and stay out of trouble. Five years from now or sooner, there'll be a much different vibe around Deshaun Watson than there currently is. Thanks. Thank God for Neil Watch's PFT, unless there's a ton of questions here, but he's got several. So that's keeping us going today. Do you think the oversight committee will do anything at the end of the day, or do you think the whole purpose of that hearing was grandstanding? Well, I, I think it's both. And it is political theater. It's performance art to a certain extent. It's depressing to watch. That's how our sausage gets made as a government. But at the same time, there are two bills that are being introduced to address some of the problems that have come to light by virtue of the commander's investigation. So I think something will be done. I think Snyder is going to get subpoenaed because they said they're going to subpoena him. And when he testifies... Who knows what the end result of that is going to be? Who knows if he's going to face some allegation that he lied to Congress or committed perjury? Who knows? So there's still plenty of steps left before we get to the bottom of this. And the reality is they have until 
November, December, January, when the new, assuming that the Republicans retake control of the House and then retake control of all of the committees and the plug gets pulled immediately on whatever is left of this commander's investigation, the clock is ticking toward the point at which the Democrats will no longer be able to set the agenda and determine who gets investigated and who doesn't. And, and look, it's not a political comment. I mean, it's political because it's recognizing political realities. I'm in favor of the commanders being investigated and scrutinized here because there, there seems to be no other path for getting to the truth. And it's too easy for the NFL to brush it under the rug. That was one of the things that was said yesterday by multiple members of the committee. We shouldn't care about this because the NFL took care of it. The question is, did they really take care of it? Did they properly take care of it? Is it enough to brush it all under the rug and say, we're not telling you anything? We don't have to. We're a private business. It is a very public private business. Just because it isn't publicly traded, it is a public business. It relies on the money, the attention, and the time of the public. Not to mention public dollars for stadiums. Not to mention the broadcast antitrust exemption. It is a key part of our public life. And as I've said, and I'm repeating myself, but I don't care. It's an important point. Nothing else brings together millions of people for a three-hour chunk like the National Football League and a live game. So uh, I think this is going to keep going, at least until the new Congress is seated. <laughs> Neil says, this is not a question. I know a lot of us are still hoping for PFT zip-ups. Maybe someday. This is the only one. This is the prototype. Prototype that never went anywhere. So as long as it holds together, I'm going to keep wearing it. Maybe we will find a way to make some more. One more from Neil before we move on. Do you have any big plans for the remainder of the hiatus? Well, first of all, it really hasn't felt like a hiatus. I mean, I was busier yesterday than I ever am, other than during football season, with the commander situation, with all of the posts we did on that, with the video that we did, and radio appearances and podcasts. And that's fine. You got to take your news when you find it. We don't make the stories. The stories make us. Got to cover it. Got to cover it like we always cover it with candor and with transparency and with an effort to help people understand exactly what is going on in the National Football League. And I think most people out there understand what we do, how we do it and appreciate it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to try to enjoy myself. I got some other stuff I'm working on. I'm just going to relax as best I can, read some books and uh, wait for July 25 when we can get back to doing PFT Live two hours a day, every day, seven to nine Eastern on Peacock and Sirius XM. 85. All right. What else do we have? Maximus Overdrive. What can we expect to hear from Daniel Snyder next week? What happens if he doesn't show? Is that even a possibility? Um, if he gets subpoenaed and he doesn't show up, he's got a problem. He potentially gets arrested. So I'll be surprised if it happens next week. I don't even know that they can make service. I, I joked about that yesterday. He's in France. I don't know what the rules are for serving a subpoena from Congress in France. But one way or the other, they'll get him subpoenaed and he'll have to testify. And when he does, you can tell the truth and face the consequences, or you can not tell the truth and face the consequences. But it will be and could be and should be very interesting when it happens. Ian Forrester, given how much the Broncos sold for recently, does this make the slim chance of any non-USA franchise even slimmer than it is now? I, I, don't, I don't know that that affects the possibility of a team being in another country. I don't. It's just going to be expensive. For whoever buys a franchise, if it's an expansion team, it's going to be very expensive the price is going to keep going up and up and up. And as we reported, Josh Harris would have paid $5 billion for the Broncos if he knew that would have delivered the team. When he was unable to get an assurance that $5 billion would get it done, he decided not to put $5 billion on the table because he knew he was going to be jumped by the Walmart group that would have offered well over $5 billion to get the team. As it stands, 4.65, but the numbers keep going up. And I, I still think eventually, especially when slash if, when the NFL expands, we'll see a team in London or two, two, two stadiums, two teams, just like Al Michaels said years ago, when the NFL returns 
to LA, it'll be two teams, not one. And he was right on the money, even though it was a year apart, it was two teams and it'll be two teams in London. If that ever happens, what else do we have? Uh, James Hannon, when's big cat back? Uh, you know, I think we reached out to him. There was a day not that long ago where we had a hole because I think when the Sims went to Cincinnati to interview Burrow and he wasn't available. I, look, he's busy. He's busy. He's big time. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, like, oh, he's big time. And maybe, you know, the guy's busy. Uh, he, he will show up from time to time. Hopefully we'll get him back at some point on a Friday when Peter King's not available. But the usual schedule is Chris Sims Monday through Thursday with Peter King on Friday. Now, last year, Sims was off on Mondays. We had Mike Goldick instead because Sims does that postgame show on Peacock. So I don't know what's going to happen this season, but either way, you got to deal with me two hours a day, every weekday on Peacock, unless I get sick 10 minutes into the show and have to bail. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I don't even remember when that was. Isn't it weird how our days kind of blend from one to the next? And, and just like with, you know, we're talking about earlier, Deshaun Watson and memories fade. Memories do fade. Like that was a bad day. I was miserable that day. And I can't even remember when it was. It was a Thursday though. I, I, th I think I was where, I, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't think I had the patience to find this one. I think I just grabbed a different quarter zip, but that was a bad day. This is a better day. It would be even better if we had PFT live, but the next best thing is PFT OT. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC sports.